I think Nelson Mandela said that it doesn't matter how many awards you get or how much money you have, but how many people's life have you changed? And that no money in this world can pay for the happiness of someone who was blind. And when you take off that iPad and they tell you, doctor, oh my child, I can see. That is very, very gratifying. And that's why we keep on going back all the time. My name is uh, Helen Andume. I was born in Sume, and it was during the colonial apartheid uh, uh, time when we were colonized by South Africa. My name is Wadamaya, mm -hmm. one and only annoying village boy from Ghana. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Very annoying. The anointed one. Yeah. No, not anointed. Uh -huh. Annoying. Oh, annoying. Oh, no, you are not annoying at all. We love you. Uh -oh. We just love the, wa the way you are marketing Africa, putting it out there for the world to know that Africa is not what is perceived in the Western world that maybe that you are just some trees like monkeys eating banana. There are incredible people on this, continent, on this continent. And you are one of them. <laughs> Thank you for putting me among those. No, 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 you're among one of them. And that is why I'm here today. Mm -hmm. You started sending me your profiles, yeah, huh? telling me that one thing that they even love about you yeah. is about the charity that you do. Mm -hmm. You're actually giving people the chance to see again. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that is true, but I think we need to hear from you. I come from the town in northern Namibia, almost maybe, let me say, 400 kilometers from the northern borders with Angola. Mm. And uh, during the war, when we were fighting to liberate Namibia, of course, many young people were leaving the country to join SWAPO. And uh, SWAPO was the organization fighting to liberate Namibia. And it was that time based in Zambia and, of course, also Angola. And uh, young people were leaving the country. Many people were leaving the country to go and join the struggle. And some of us also heard that if you go to Swapo, you will get the best education because the education that was in Namibia by then, it was the apartheid system of education where uh, black people's education was not on par with the white people's education. I was the schools where there was a big disparity there. Okay, we left. We were four girls. We escaped at night, came at the borders in Angola, and the South African soldiers were patrolling the border. Anyway, by the grace of God, we managed to cross the borders and then went into Angola. In Angola, we found um, Swapo's uh, soldiers or the freedom fighters already there receiving these new kids who are coming from Namibia. Okay. Also, during that time, there was war in Angola between, that was 1975, among the three parties, UNITA, FNLA, and, MPL, and, uh, and MPLA. But MPLA, by then, they were the ones ruling the country, and they were the true representative of the Angolan people. Okay. And the president was um, Agostino Neto, who later died, of course. And then uh, through the war, we managed to pass in Angola. And uh, sometimes you come into a town, you are in the middle of the war, in the middle of the night while you are sleeping, the bullets all over, flying on top of you there. Then you move on, you come into the town, you find only corpses on the bo bodies lying all over. And imagine the tender age of 15 seeing all this. It was very terrifying. And uh, we managed. Uh, to go through all these uh, wars. And uh, I know even our car even broke down. We had to walk for something like more than 100 kilometers. Walking? Yes, yeah, walking. Going towards the borders of Zambia and Angola to enter into, into Zambia. So later on the car, they managed to repair to get reinforcement. 
it was repaired. They found us walking and went in the car, proceeded. We came now at the borders uh, with Zambia, Angola, the border between Angola and Zambia. Now there was a river, the Kwando River. Now how to cross this river? We didn't know how to swim coming from Namibia. Swimming pools were just for white people. The only water that we used to plunge in is when it rains, when the water comes with all the dead, that's where we used to play and swim. That's paddling. No, I wouldn't say swim because we didn't know how to swim. And um, now they brought the dugout canoe. This was a, an Angolan man with a dugout canoe and we were told that now you have to get into this canoe. What? And we started crying there yeah, with our little suitcases. We started crying, say we are not going to go there. We are going to fall in the river. Yeah. yeah, and they. It took them maybe more than an hour for them to convince us. In the end, we agreed. We went into the canoe, and we were really shaking. <laughs> one canoe were in one canoe, and then our suitcases were in the other canoe. And then we went into this, into this canoe, sailing now, and then you found that they, there were some narrow strips. And then suddenly you come into a big area. And mind you, this is the river, the Quanto River, where South Africa recognizes used to come looking for Namibian freedom fighter for our Swapo guerrillas so that they can bomb them. And um, we crossed. We were shaking there, but af as children, after 10, 15 minutes, we started loving it. We still started <laughs> singing the <free> our <laughs> sing. liberation songs. And, uh, the, but the moment we come into this open big area, then we keep quiet. Ooh, we came, became so scared, and then we pass again. Uh, when, if you tell me to do that today, I will never do it. Because that is where the hippos are. That's where they breed their children, the crocodiles. How? I don't even want to think about it. And then we cross, came onto the Zambia. People were already receiving us, in, waiting to receive us in Zambia. Went to Zambia. We were now in a camp that we built ourselves and... Schools were there, hospital, they got all these people. Some Namibians left already in the 60s to join the liberation struggle. The comrade Sam Nuyoma, our former president, they left in the 60s already and um, they were there. They received us, we built our school. The teachers, we, we had some Namibians who were studying all over the world, America, England, whatever, they were recalled to come back so that they could teach these young people who just left uh, Namibia. Even one of the doctors, like Dr. Libertina Madela, who she became my adopted mother later, they were recalled to come and start clinics and to treat uh, sick people in the refugee, in the Swapo refugee camps. Okay, fine. On the diplomatic front, also we had uh, our Swapo leaders negotiating seriously with Afri other African countries so that mm. they can take some of these children into mm. their country to go to school there. And that's how some of us, how I landed in the Gambia. Uh, somewhere went to Cameroon, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, the Gambia, Riba, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia. We were spread all over. And I ended up in the Gambia. And that's why I told you the story how my first landing, coming out on the plane for the first time, the first country that I landed into was Accra. And we were staying there at Kotoka International Airport. And that's why when I went back two years ago, I was looking for this Kotoka International Airport. That was nowhere to be seen. The whole place <laughs> has changed, changed completely. completely. Yeah, it has changed completely. Which, which year was that when you... 1976. 1976. 1976. That's that was a, first time. Yeah. That was my first time going to Ghana. And uh, of course, 2018, I just went there uh, with my son and my niece just to show them where I went to school to. And um, also Ghana, of course, where I landed first, and to take them also to Gold, to, okay, to, to Cape Coast, 
to see where the 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 place of no return, return is. Yeah, how Africans were taken from their motherland for 400 years to the Americans. So how our yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, so I mean, I, I want to know. You landed in Ghana mm -hmm. for how many days before going to Gambia? Like 10 days. 10 days, 10 days yeah. What were you doing in Ghana for the past 10 Oh, days? we were uh, normally just being shown around the place and to also, because there was a group of Ghanaian students who went before us. So just to stay with them. And of course, they were also looking forward for people who are coming from the refugee camps to tell them what is the latest, how the fight is going, whether we are making progress on whatever, just to connect also with other while we are waiting to go to the other countries. And it was also during holiday that mm. time, they, they were all on holiday. So from there, we went to Sierra Leone. We stayed also maybe a week in Sierra Leone, left some students there, and then we continued further to, to, to the Gambia. Gambia. Mm. So you, you schooled in the Gambia? I schooled in the Gambia. That's where I did my secondary school. Then from there, what happened? So after secondary school, of course, um, I came back to, to Angola. I finished my secondary school. When you finish your secondary school, you go back to the camps in Angola. That's the refugee camps. The refugee camps. Because you must know also the people were still coming. The refugee camps were becoming bigger and bigger. You have in Zambia and then you had in Angola. You had in Angola. And um, then you go like for one year, you teach the small kids in the refugee camps or you are giving some assignments to do before you go to university. And when I came back, I work in Luanda in our SWAPO office, in the transport office. We are the one now taking care of the logistic and making, because SWAPO was getting a lot of donation from other, uh, from other countries, especially the Scandinavian countries, clothing, food, and we load them on trucks so that they can be transported to the refugee camps. Or also where the, the battlefields, where our soldiers were, so they also need food, they need clothing, they need soap, they need, you know, medicine. Everything was transported. You, uh, so where did you have your university education? So after the one year I stayed there, so then I was told that now the scholarship open to go to Germany. That time it was uh, uh, German Democratic Republic. So I went to Germany and that's where I did medicine. I wanted to go and do fashion, actually. My first preference was fashion, and medicine was number two, second preference. And uh, our Secretary of Education by then, Nas Angola, who later also became the Minister of Education and later the Prime Minister, told me that this fashion of yours is not going to work. <laughs> Uh, independent Namibia will need medical doctors than fashion designers, so you are going to do medicine. I just didn't understand this. I said, how can fashion not be important? You know, when you are young. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I had this guiding angels. I said, okay, and in Africa, we are brought up that when an elder says something, mm. you don't answer or refuse. So I said, okay, yeah, I'm going to do medicine. So. I went to do medicine in Germany. Okay. So, lucky enough, when I finished medicine, that when I finished my study, that's 1989, that's when also we were being repatriated back to come to Namibia. Yeah. That time, there was no independence. And now, it, there was no, it was not independence. Yeah. We are just being repatriated back to go and have a, a United Resolution 435 was went into action, we were now told to come back home. People were coming back home to take part in the elections. And like I said, thanks God, Swapo won the elections. Yeah. After being one, I stayed, I came, I worked in the hospital as an intern, doing my internship. And after my internship, I went back again to Germany to specialize. Okay. Yeah, and that's how I specialized 
in in uh, in ophthalmology, eye specialist. You know what? Mm. I got to know you because you're an eye specialist. Yeah. And one of the things that everyone is talking about you mm. is you being notable mm. for the charity work that you're doing. Mm. You're actually giving a lot of people mm. the chance to see again. Yeah. I mean, you could be in your office, treat people. Yeah. Even when they were telling you, I thought, is she a magician? Why, why is it again? <laughs> Everybody see again. So we just want to know mm. what, what really inspired you to, I mean, do what you do, like in terms of like um, giving back to the society. Yeah, and you know, when we were in the refugee camps, and uh, sometimes Sam Nuyoma, Comrade Sam Nuyoma, would come and tell us, young people, you have to study very hard. You have to go and give back to the oppressed Namibian, to our oppressed Namibian back at home. We have to go, it's only education which will make it possible for us to develop our country. And of course, taking into consideration that my, my, all my studies were never paid for my, my parents. There was no, there's no way where my parents were even going to have the money to send me to school. And uh, when I finished my medicine, you, came, you, you come back home here, and then you find that, um, um, like when I was in my internship, people will also have eye problems, but they really don't complain about the eyes. They just say my chest or my stomach, and those, those are the problems that they give you. But you know that, and you see many people are going blind, and then, I also wanted to do occupational medicine to specialize, and then my Auntie Libertina, she's also a medical doctor, you, with your, these little hands, I think you must just go and specialize in ophthalmology. We need, I said, yeah, okay. So I went to do, I went back, I did ophthalmology, and um, came back. And when I came back, of course, um, I started now this program. Actually, I started the program with um, some Americans I met in um, an organization called Surgical Eye Expedition. They are based in Santa Barbara. And, and before that, I went to India. Because when I finished my specialization, I said, how do I go home with all the high tech here in Germany? If things are going to be, t might be tough for me. And then my professor, my German professor told me, why don't you go to India? You will learn a lot there. And I did that. I went to India, I was there for eight months. I saw so many diseases that I only read in textbooks. And, um, uh, the, uh, and uh, it, it, our, my Indian colleague were diagnosing uh, or, or diagnosing disease or seeing diseases just by looking with a torch. While in, in Germany we have to use, you know, the magnifying, magnifying slit lamp. I say, how do you do that? Then later, I will take this patient, put them on the magnifying slit lamp, and then it's this, what I see is exactly what they were telling me. I say, wow, this is what I needed. Doing, providing proper health care with the little that you have. And that was very impressive. And that's also where I learned how you to go out into the village, collect these patients and give them sight. Do surgeries there and give them sight. Bringing the health to the poor people in the village. If you go to the village, you find empty Coca-Cola tins and whatever. Coca-Cola is marketing itself in the village. Where are we as doctors? We should also market ourselves into the villages. And, um, okay, I said my education was never paid off by my parents. It was because of Swapo that I got where I am, so it's better I have to go and give back. I was given back, I must also give back. Started this program, Surgical Eye Expedition, and since 1997, with my first eye camp, we went to, to do the screening up north there in a place called Rundu. And uh, we screened so many people, more than 500 people we were screening. 
and we book more than 200 to come for the operation. But when we went back, after three weeks after we went back, only maybe 80 people came. Now we were saying, why? Where are all of them? Now it was going around in the villages that, where have you had someone operating on, on an eye? It was unheard of. This little girl is just going to damage your eyes, even though they were already blind. They couldn't see. She just going to damage your eyes. Fine. We went, we did this 80 people, and then we went back home. Those who came in who could not see, just being pulled on the stick, they went back on their own, walking free. When we went back the following year, yeah, we couldn't control the crowds at all. There were so many. And even those who, that we opened said, doctor, we have come back for the second eye. Come, 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 come. Look at all these ladies here, women. I brought them along. Wow. They were also blind like me. And the interesting thing, she was walking in front with her one eye seeing, and all the others are holding on her dress. This one is holding on her dress, the other one on the other one dress, the other one on the, it was like in the queue. Very interesting things to do. And it just brings tears to your, to your eyes. And that's how it started. Every year we we'll go to like three, four places, four regions, and we did, did these items. So one thing which I have to mention here is that my government was very receptive and they helped a lot with the logistic for us to bring medicine or help to the people who needed it most. It was it was a very well coordinated thing. And uh, it, you can do this also when you have a government that is also willing to do their part and help. We have been doing this for since 1997 until today. You know, you come somewhere, you come after you have done your surgery and then you, I go around, you find this woman who came who, who couldn't see anything. She's sitting down there eating fish and taking out all the bones. There's many thanks you that you get. Doctor, now that I can see, I'm going to work on my field. Doctor, now that I can see, I'm going to see my grandchildren. Doctor, now that I can see um, my pension money. Nobody will take my pension money. I will see my pension money now. This happiness, it, it just fuels you to keep on going back. It's very difficult to organize such an item, but you think about the innocent person in the village that just keep on pushing, just keep on pushing, put a smile on someone's face. I think Nelson Mandela said that it doesn't matter how many awards you get or how much money you have, but how many people's lives have you changed. And that no money in this world can pay for the happiness of someone who was blind. And when you take off that iPad and they tell you, doctor, oh my child, I can see. That is very, very gratifying. And that's why we keep on going back all the time. I, I, I want to say that mm -hmm. uh, keep up the good work. Yeah. And congratulations because we are from Ghana. <laughs> yeah. We heard about you. Yeah. That's why we came over here. Mm -hmm. Now I just want you to come to Africa. Yeah. I know we, we all live in Africa. Namibia is in Africa. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we want to know yeah, do you believe that there are opportunities, there are opportunities in Africa that young Africans can, I mean, mine, other opportunities on the continent? that young Africans can mind? Of course, there are many, many opportunities on the African continent. We, for the millennial to take part, uh, for the millennials to grab. One thing is this, the entitlement, it must stop. And waiting for, sometimes waiting for governments, it must stop. Do your part. Don't wait for government all the time. But it is also true that our government must also set up incentive and institution to help these capable young people to come up. Mm? It's not that when these young people are coming, I have this project, whatever. No, go away, whatever. Next time you find is the Chinese who are coming to do the thing. 
Thank you. Yeah. So which means that I have to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of Africans that are living in the diaspora. Yeah. They keep on complaining, seeing Chinese, mm -hmm. um, the West coming to Africa mm -hmm. to invest in Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they are there. Yeah. Do you think it, it's time for them to get involved on the change that is going on on the continent? Mm -hmm. You have in Germany. You mm. studied in Germany. Mm -hmm. You should have stayed in Germany forever. Yeah. You decided to come back and be part yeah. of the change. I yeah. don't think you have a message for your fellow brothers and sisters living in the diaspora. Yeah, I have a message. They should come back and contribute and do their part. But also, don't just push them to come back when you have not created, in created incentives for them to come back to. But the thing is that yeah. you came to create. <laughs> Yeah, I, I came because my, my, my government was there also to help me. They created this uh, uh, um, environment for me, to, conducive environment for me to work in. But if you don't do that for the young people, they will remain where they are. But the most disheartening thing, we went out as slaves, been taking a slave to go and build the Americas. But today, no. We are not being taken by the white people as slaves. We are in, instead going ourselves in the canoes, whatever those bo boats, mm. uh, rubbish boats. I'm very sorry to say that, but uh, terrible condition, the way now they are living, closing the Mediterranean Sea. What, our, what is our African, what are our African leaders doing about it? How do they feel? Seeing our young people dying on the seas, how do they feel? Hmm? Yesterday we were taking a slaves. Now, now they, because you didn't create conducive environment for our young people to flourish in, they are living in mass. Are you trying to say that there's a problem with African leadership? I think there is. If you don't create proper conducive environment for your young people to flourish in, they will run away. If you are taking, if you are allowing other people to come and plunder everything, I mean, look at the mining. Who is mining our gold? Who is mining our uh, platinum? Who is mining our whatever? You find that our people are nowhere there to be seen. What do you expect? They run away. Mm. If you had a chance to change one thing mm. in the continent, Africa, mm. what would that be? Wow, very difficult question. I don't know. <laughs> very difficult question. Uh, if it's not, if, if even it's not one, maybe if you have many things that you want to change about the continent. Universal health coverage. That is what I want to have in this continent, where you don't have to pay an arm and a leg to get proper health, to get proper health treatment. That's what I want. Is there a problem with our healthcare system? There is. If you don't have money, you don't have the, you don't get the best treatment. Mm. Yeah, that's why people, those who have money, they go to Europe or maybe now to India. Look at the, the medical tourism, going, people going to India. Mm -hmm. It's because that the Indians have revolutionized their health system. Mm? The they are making so. men manufacturing medicine. Most of majority, they are the biggest makers of vaccine also. Mm? Where are we as Africans here? Why can we be the same? We have the most educated people. The most, if you go to America, top doctors are Africans, especially from West Africa, from your country, they are there. Why can't they come back? Because we have never created conducive environment for them to work in. Hmm? This has resulted in a brain drain. Mm, yeah, exactly. So brain drain. It is so bad. It's very, very bad. Final message to mm. each and every African watching us right now. Mm -hmm. the final message. Uh, no, I wish all the Africans very well. We must hold the hands, put our hands together to make a better Africa for our grandchildren. We have the wealth, we can do it. We have the wealth, we can do it. Exactly, we have the wealth. Diamond is here, gold is here, platinum. Look at Congo. Very rich, they have almost every metal you can think about. We can do it. <laughs> I want to say <laughs> thank you so much for talking to yeah. me. I really appreciate your time.
Thank you.